Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Jeanette Mancia Martinez, and we are really excited that you took the time to join us on a Tuesday, late afternoon, early evening to hear about some of the amazing research being conducted across the five departments at Peabody College. Um, so I am the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Graduate Education, and the Peabody Research Spotlight started last academic year and was also on Zoom. We're hoping that we will um, have some sessions in person when it is safe to do so. But for now, this has proven to be a very nice way to get a sense of the excellent research that is being conducted across our five departments. And I'm so excited to welcome today five of my colleagues um, that are representing our five departments. So we have Yolanda McDonald, who is in the Department of Community Research and Action. We have Sean Doherty, who is in the Department of Leadership Policy and Organization. Sarah Brown Smith, who is in psychology and human development, Joe Lambert in special education, and Louise Leva in the Department of Teaching and Learning. So each of them will tell you a little bit about themselves and also about specifically about the work that is being conducted in their respective research labs. Um, my doctoral student has graciously agreed to assist us during this session and to um, take questions and comments that you have. If you can insert those in the chat function, that will be fantastic. What will happen is that immediately following each presentation, um, Min will ask some of the questions or share some of the comments that you enter into the um, chat function and will allow our participants to engage with you. And depending on how we do on time, at the very end of the session, there may be time to pick up on some questions that we just couldn't get to in the interest of time, but we will plan to end right at 5 p.m. to honor everyone's time. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. If you can make sure that you are muted throughout the presentations, that would be really appreciated. And without any further ado, I am going to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Yolanda McDonald. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking time to join us. So I'm just going to jump right into this and talk today about the Drinking Water Justice Lab at Vanderbilt and our goal to build a place-based framework to inform equitable drinking water health policy. And this is in the context of the United States. Next slide, please. And next slide. So what is the Drinking Water Justice Lab? Well, our mission is to facilitate community engagement and why? Because we want to create ongoing awareness and understanding, evidence-based understanding of drinking water justice, which we design as accessibility, affordability, and drinking water quality. We also provide an immersive interdisciplinary research training experience for students. Now, the image on the left-hand side was the first summer of COVID, and we were restricted to having virtual meetings, and we operated our lab virtually. Now, to the right are images this from this past summer, we were able to go out into the field and collect drinking water samples from private well residents who received their drinking water through that format. And the picture to the right is one of our stakeholders from the Tennessee Department of Health. Next picture, please. Next slide. So I mentioned the Tennessee Department of Health. Our work would not be possible without the collaborations of the Tennessee Department of Health, Environment and Conservation, the Tennessee Association of Utility Districts, which is the oldest organization representing the water sector in the United States, as well as the University of Rochester Medical Center. Next slide, please. Our research, we use community-based participatory research. Now, most of you are probably familiar with this, but I just want to emphasize that the continuum, it's important that you complete the entire continuum. And what I mean by that is just not informing stakeholders that you're going to be doing research in the area, but consulting them, having them be part of the research process through this involvement, collaborating at every step, including just, um, formulating research questions, and also dissemination and being part of the decision-making process and respecting that we all have different types of research needs. Now, the image to the right is the environmental field offices. And I highlight this because a portion of our research involves going to each of these facilities and meeting with water utility, operators, as well as representatives from TDEC field offices. And then to the right-hand side is an image that we have from a virtual meeting with our operator advisory committee, going back to the community-based participatory research that we do before we publish results or, um, or have um, conferences. We do discuss our findings 
to ensure that there's a context and that we are not misinterpreting any of our findings based to a lack of knowledge per se about the water sector. Um, and then this little image to the, on the bottom is our operators as well as our stakeholders help us design databases and what is needed. They have input in that. Next slide, please. So how does this all work? I mentioned the Vanderbilt Drinking Water Justice Lab. Well, we're guided by three, fun, three framing um, philosophies, which are frameworks, I should say. So Ballast and Ray's Drinking Water Framework, and that's the one to the right-hand side, the gray bubble here. This focuses on various factors within the natural, built, and social political environments impact and are impacted by a series of actors. And this operates at the state, county, community, and household level which in turn impacts drinking water quality as well as accessibility and affordability. So this work has greatly influenced, this framework has greatly influenced, influenced our approaches, not only to how we think of drinking water, but also how we think of workforce engagement. Next, I wanna to briefly touch on Vanderslice's frameworks on the components of drinking water infrastructure. And what this does, again, emphasizes these layers that we have to work with federal, state, and regulatory agencies and how these influence quality, affordability, and accessibility. And then lastly, the social determinants of health. We posit that drinking water is often overlooked as a component of the built environment. And when it is included, it's usually at the unit of analysis of the county level, which is problematic because 96% of counties in the United States have more than one community water system. Therefore, when we're assessing race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic characteristics, it's not at the correct spatial match, which then can create policies that do not properly address the needs of community members. Next slide, please. So that leads to this project here. Next slide, please. The Tennessee Community Water System Estimated Service Area Boundaries. Now I mentioned that we went to all of those field offices. Part of going to all of those field offices was collecting maps and coming back and digitizing those so that we could go from paper maps or no maps, they just did not exist, so that we can now look at where people live rather than saying one county, multiple water systems. Now we actually have what we call the polygon, the spatial boundaries of that. So to date, out of 458 community water systems, and a community water system is the primary source for residential water, 85% of these, map, these maps have been created representing 94% of the population. So this information has been used, for example, when there's a, uh, a, a spill and the TDEC or the Department of Health needs to know what potential water systems in the populations that would, have been, would be affected. Next slide, please. The next project, this led us to, well, if Tennessee doesn't have these boundaries, do other states have these boundaries? In 2010, when Vanderslice asked the same exact question, he found that there was less than a dozen states that had these boundaries represented, which may seem crazy. Like we don't know where the water system boundaries were. Well, no, we did not. Next slide, please. So our lab embarked on this process through Google searches and also through numerous phone calls. And we identified 31 states that had some format of representation of geospatial community water systems. This was a huge improvement from a decade earlier. So this is an image and this shows the different representation and I know it might be a little hard to see this image here, but what we found was that 26 states had these boundaries. So this is gonna enable our lab to conduct research. We'll bring in the race, ethnicity, and other, other socioeconomic, as well as environmental data sets. So we can have a better understanding of what's happening at the community level. And again, work with departments of health and environment conservation across the US. Next slide, please. So how does this all work together? This all works together by bringing all these multiple data sets, which we call relational data sets, because we made primary key connectors and creating the first US comprehensive drinking water database. So this way we can look at questions about water quality, accessibility, affordability, and we can look at this at multiple scales at a county level so that that's how most departments of health operate. So we're able to scale up and scale down based upon our research question and need. Next slide, please. And this is just an image, for example, of the different data sets that we bring in. Water quality by contaminant level, because it's important for us to understand what the health impacts are. And next slide, please. 
just want to make sure I don't go over time. So our last, um, not our last project, but how this all connects to my training as a medical health geographer is what's the health, human health impact? Why do we care about drinking water? Well, one, it's necessary for human life. Next slide, please. But what does it actually mean to us on a day-to-day -day basis? So we've worked with the National Primary Drinking Water Regulations, and we were curious about the potential health effects. So we looked at this and saw that it was mainly acute diseases, and it talked about illness rather than a human body organ system approach. Next slide, please. So working with VMUC clinicians and working with Vanderbilt students, what we're looking at is the concept of water toxicity accumulation in our human body organ systems. And as we map these contaminants to the human body organ system, that will we find that communities that have a higher prevalence, for example, of chronic kidney disease or cardiovascular disease is an ignored component, potentially the drinking water source. So that's one of the projects that we're um, in the process right now. And um, thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. Just want to thank all the lab members who um, have contributed to our ongoing research and our external investigators. And lastly, our funders. Next slide. And that's it. I know that was a lot really quick. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. McDonald. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Min and see that if there are some comments or questions for you. Min. Yes, thank, th uh, thank you, Dr. McDonald. Uh, there is one question for you starting off. Um, given the high interdisciplinary nature of your work, could you speak to different strategies that you and your team use to communicate your findings to different stakeholders, such as health department representatives or frontline water professionals? Um, definitely. And, um, and a lot of that just really goes back to your community-based participatory research approach is that we learn from our stakeholders as much as they learn from us and be respectful of the fact that we all have an onboarding process. So when our lab members come in, it's a five week just understanding drinking water and also understanding public policy, health, GIS, geospatial thinking, so that our students and our faculty members are able to converse and also to an environment where people can ask questions and um, also check ourselves for jargon, that while jargon may be necessary in certain formats and audiences, that um, our stakeholders are very cognizant of, of using jargon and then explaining to us what it means so that we're able to be nimble and have quick conversations, but also take the time to explain when we know we have a new member in the lab. Thank you. And related to that question, could you share how you go about raising awareness among the general public about drinking water safety? Yes. So we do that through op-eds, as well as through um, working with the water sector, as well as going to general meetings, working with community members. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of environmental justice activity that happens in the Middle Tennessee area. So just having that presence. So um, we engage in public scholarship, as well as peer-reviewed scholarship, as well as industry and academic conferences. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. McDonald. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter for today. And I will hand it over to Dr. Doherty. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks to everyone who's <clears throat> excuse me, joining, joining us uh, today. Um, so my research lab focuses generally on, on youth transition to adulthood. And, and I intend to talk about the ways in which uh, that work is, is happening uh, across a, a, a mul multiple projects and contexts. Um, so next next slide, please. Um, so, so mainly my work is thinking about the transition from, from secondary education to post-secondary education, employment, and training. Uh, this stems directly from my experience as a high school math teacher and, and school administrator, uh, and thinking about the experiences that students do and do not have uh, that help them feel engaged in, in high school and, and think critically about the different pathway options available to them uh, as they move from high school into to life after high school. Um, inevitably, this involves thinking about the intersection and overlap between you know, formal high school experiences, workforce experiences, and post-secondary 
education and training, both formal and informal. And, and most of the work is focusing on dimensions of inequality in, in either access or outcomes uh, for youth based on their family income, uh, gender, their race, ethnicity, uh, or uh, their disability status. Um, and, and often at the intersection of multiple dimensions of, of, of student uh, identity and, and how they influence kind of whether and how they have access to di different secondary and post-secondary experiences. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the, the work is, I think, mod modest in, in scale. At, at the moment, there are four PhD students that work alongside uh, myself, a postdoctoral fellow and a part-time analyst and, and, and manager, um, but, but includes um, master students and, and undergraduate students um, various in varying numbers uh, depending on the, the point in time. Co COVID and uh, virtual participation has, has changed some of the engagement, um, but we, we aim to create a, a lab environment in which there's a scaffolded set of experiences that are tailored to uh, the sort of not knowledge and experience that folks bring to the work uh, that capitalize on their assets, but that build uh, sets of skills and experiences over time related to understanding uh, youth transition to adulthood. And I'll say some more in just the next slide, please, uh, for kind of how we're, we're doing that. So most of the, the work is focused on um, students' engagement in career and technical education experiences in, in, in high school. Um, and, and so this ha happens in a, in a variety of ways, but mostly as part of their formal coursework while, while, while in high school. Um, and, and studying it across a, a number of, of contexts. Uh, so uh, across a, a few different sources of, of, of funded work, uh, one ongoing project funded by the Institute of Education Sciences is estimating the impact of attending uh, specialized technical high schools in, in Connecticut. Uh, students apply to these schools when they're in middle school and the schools are so popular uh, that they have more applicants than they could admit. And, and because of the idiosyncrasies and, and how admissions decisions are, are then made, we can estimate the, the causal impact of getting into and attending these schools on, on students' attendance in high school, their, their test scores, uh, whether they graduate from high school, wh whether and where they go to college, and if they complete a cert certificate or degree, and, and then their employment and earnings through age 25. So relying on administrative data in partnership with the state of Connecticut uh, and the Connecticut Technical High School System and the, the Connecticut Department of Education, we're able to bring together a variety of data sets to, to track students longitudinally to understand both the, the short-term and the medium-term impacts of, of having these experiences. Um, and specifically related to the theme of, of the lab, uh, how youth are, are experiencing the transition to adulthood in both secondary and uh, workforce outcomes. Uh, a, a, a second related project is thinking about the, the teacher workforce as it pertains to career and technical education. About 10% of all high school teachers are, would be identified as teaching in a career and technical education area. Um, and there's relatively little known on a statewide scale in, in terms of who is becoming a teacher and where teachers that leave the profession, if they're not leaving by way of retirement, where, where they go into the private sector. And so this second theme of research is focusing on using, again, longitudinal data systems, the, the P20 integrated data system in Tennessee to observe uh, who becomes a CTE teacher uh, and among CTE teachers who, who leave by way of you know areas other than retire or pathways other than retirement, seeing to what industries uh, they, they migrate or if they just uh, appear to leave, leave the state, so that we can better inform uh, state and local policymakers around how to optimally design uh, certification requirements and incentives to to in entice or retain teachers into the the CTE teaching profession, um, and, and and then thir third third. Uh, a project looking uh, at the, again, career and technical education experiences of students in Massachusetts, where we're emphasizing trying to really understand who opts into participating in career and technical education to varying levels while in high school. Um, and in Massachusetts, there are different ways that students do this. They can take individual elective courses in their kind of residentially assigned comprehensive high school or there are CTE dedicated or, or specialty high schools that are essentially public schools of choice, though, though not char chartered. They serve as independent districts 
analogous to the schools we're studying in, in Connecticut. Um, but we're really just trying to understand what, what factors, experiences, uh, and observable characteristics of, of youth prior to going to high school predict their likelihood of participating in career and technical education uh, to, to better uh, understand how uh, educators and policymakers might, might inform uh, how, to, how to optimize the supply uh, of CTE, both geospatially, um, but, but also uh, in, in terms of specific schools uh, or, or pathways of study. Next slide, please. Um, and, and so this work happens in conjunction uh, with a, a few different overarching en entities, one being the CTE Research Network, which is funded by the Institute of Education Sciences uh, and, and brings together uh, pro project directors P and, and PIs from projects that are all aiming to understand the causal impact of, of career and technical education experiences in, in high school and in post-secondary spaces um, and, and, and how that impacts late, later outcomes. And then next slide, please. Uh, the, the other way that this work is happening in conjunction with, with my lab is through the CTE Policy Exchange or, or CTEX, which is a multi-state research lab uh, that includes PIs in, in the states listed here, myself included in Massachusetts, um, Celeste Carruthers at UT Knoxville and for Tennessee, uh, and, and a variety of folks throughout uh, Michigan, Washington, Montana, and, and Metro Atlanta. Um, and, and the idea there is to try to create some comparability across uh, otherwise incomparable set of 51 state systems to understand how similar sets of experiences and investments in career and technical education uh, in high school relate to later student outcomes and, and again attending to multiple dimensions uh, of, of equity um, as, as it pertains to student access and outcomes. Next slide. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Doherty. That was really interesting. And I see that we already have some questions for you. So I'll turn it over to Min. Yes, thank you. Uh, first question for you is about the network of um, research labs. Um, Hunter asked uh, the rationale behind working with labs in Connecticut or Tennessee or Massachusetts specifically, um, rather than other states in the country. Sure. So the short answer is that at present, it's a coalition of, of the willing, um, both having political will and substantive interest on the part of either the departments of education or other stakeholders in the state. Um, and, and, and some of it is about the availability of data. So there are some other states that have expressed interest, uh, but realize they're at different uh, phases of pulling together their own data systems to be able to uh, partner with researchers to, to answer questions in comparable ways. So, so the idea in particular with, with CTEX, the, the policy lab, is to try to grow over time as we learn about differences across state systems and, and how to uh, cre create similar definitions across states given different uh, you know, data structures and, and such. And so the goal is to expand, but, but it's a coalition of the willing at the moment. Thank you. There's another question for you. Um, with increasing attention to STEM education and jobs um, in the STEM field in the recent years, have you seen any changes in CTE enrollment focused on the STEM fields? Uh, yes, in fact, I've, I've got an entire paper devoted to this and how it's changed across a little over a decade in the state of Massachusetts, where, where we're really just map, mapping out kind of in, in what areas, uh, but you can see there's an increasing share of, of total career and technical education uh, programming that is focused on, on STEM. So health sciences, information technology, um, and, and advanced uh, manufacturing or engineering fields in particular. Um, and, and we see this showing up in uh, other states as well, where the specific mix kind of differs some, somewhat. So there, there's very much a, a ma maintaining of, of the skilled trades and, and other traditional areas that folks a, a attribute with career and technical education. Um, but but a, a gr growth in the, in the STEM offerings and participation in, in those offerings over time. Thank you. And there's one last question for you. Uh, what is a turnover or a possible research spot availability within your research lab? Uh, so there's no strict upper limit on the number of people uh, in, engaging. And so I'm always open to, to hearing about folks' in, in, interest uh, in, in, in learning more about the work. Thank you so much again. And we are going to move forward with um, to hear from Dr. Sarah Brown-Smith. 
Hi. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm going to tell you about studies on memory for conversation in two domains, one on individuals with brain injury and the other looking at implications for policy and law. Uh, next, please. Um, yearly, two and a half million Americans sustain a traumatic brain injury. There are well-documented physical, social, and cognitive impacts of a TBI. The aim of my uh, work uh, that I collaborate with Dr. Duff at UMC is to identify language deficits in individuals with TBI um, in order to identify potential uh, communicative strategies to restore communication. Next slide. Um, as a first step, one project that I did with my graduate student, Yev Diacek, was to um, probe a phenomenon that we know about that may be surprising, which is that if a person, when speaking, uses disfluencies like um and uh, you actually remember what they said better. And so we tested simple memory for language in individuals with uh, a TBI, um, both sentences that were fluent, like my sister had a skiing accident and she broke her leg, as well as sentences that had pauses and ums and uhs and repeated words. Next slide. <clears throat> so here what I'm showing is um, accuracy in a memory test for people who are neurotypical and individuals with traumatic brain injury. Um, and there's two things to notice here. One is that um, overall, when sentences had disfluencies of any type, those are the sets of bars on the three on the left or on the right, um, people were more accurate in their memory for the sentences than when the sentences were completely fluent. And then the other surprising thing here is people with a traumatic brain injury showed equivalent memory performance statistically as uh, individuals who are neurotypical. Next slide, please. Um, and so this finding is consistent with um, broadly with a lot of our work that we do with people with brain injury, which is that brain injury can cause patterns of sparing and impairment where some functions are impaired by the injury and others are not. And this allows us to gain insights into brain-based mechanisms for language as well as potential treatment options. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to transition, and at the end, I'll kind of tie it back in a bow about how studying memory for language can influence policy and law. Next slide, please. It's very well established in the memory literature that after you have a conversation, memory, particularly recall of conversation, is poor and asymmetric. And what I mean by that is if you have people converse and then test their memory after brief delays, people can recall anywhere from zero to 40% of what was said. Moreover, you're much more likely to remember what you said than what was said to you. Next slide, please. As we think about and reflect on cases where high profile individuals have testified about high profile conversations they had with individuals, um, we can reflect about how, what's the utility of memory for conversation and legal proceedings, particularly considering the evidence shows that it's limited and asymmetric. Um, and I commented on this on a policy piece um, in, in a recent paper. Next slide, please. You may recall um, that during the Watergate hearings, John Dean testified about a series of um, conversations he had with President Nixon. Dean was former counsel to Nixon, and he was known for having exquisite conversational memory. He testified to the Senate. I can very vividly recall the way he sort of rolled his chair back and said, a million dollars is no problem. And what's fascinating about this testimony, and it was illustrated by Ulrich Neisser, a famous cognitive psychologist, is that Nixon had secret tapes and so Nicer was able to go back and compare the tapes to the testimony. And what was interesting about this particular um, utterance that Dean is recalling is Nixon never said this. He totally, on the tapes, talks about paying off blackmailers a million dollars, but he doesn't say that sentence. And Dean gets the date wrong. Next slide, please. So as we um, reflect on more modern cases of um, instances where a high profile individual testifies about com uh, conversations with a former president, we can start to think about what are the implications that cognitive psychology can give for these kinds of instances. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In particular, I was really fascinated when I uh, read uh, James Comey's prepared remarks for the Senate regarding his conversations with the former president, where he stated for the Senate, uh, after a meeting uh, with the former president, uh, creating written records immediately after one-on-one -on -one conversations was my practice from that point forward. And as a cognitive psychologist, I thought, well, darn, that's interesting. Next slide, please. Um, and in conversations with intelligence um, personnel, I discovered that writing uh, contemporaneous notes or memcons is common practice. You can read them from the Ford and Nixon administrations through their public library records. Next slide, please. And so in work um, with two collaborators, what we were interested in probing is what is the cognitive implication of taking memcons on memory for conversation? Next slide, please. 
And you can click through this one through all the animations. It's easier that way. So what we did is we brought subjects into the lab. They had a conversation for 10 minutes. Then we walked them around the building for five minutes. And then one of the people we told recall everything that was said. The other person we had reflect on your career plans. And we bring them back a week later. Next animation, please. And then we ask them to do oral recall. Recall everything that was said. Next slide, please. Um, and then what I can measure is of what was said in the conversation, how much is recalled at each of these time points. Um, next slide, please. And what we find is that for the person that did the immediate recall, they can recall 25% of the details on average. That same person, when we bring them a week back a week later, they're remembering 21%. But the person who did not take the notes is only recalling 16% of that conversation. Next slide, please. Perhaps even more interestingly is if you compare the memories of the two people who are tested after a week's delay, only 4% of the information in the original conversation is recalled by both. Next slide, please. So here's what I hope you'll remember. Member for conversation is extremely important. There's implications for people with brain injury, including treatment. And there's many implications for policy and law, including resolving the question as to what the probative value of conversational memory is and what actions we can do to make conversation more memorable. Last slide, please. That's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown Schmidt. That was really interesting. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and see, I think there are questions for you, Min. Yes, there are. Uh, the first question for you is, uh, with so much conversations happening virtually now, have you noticed or studied how, how memory for conversation works differently between in-person versus virtual conversations? That's an excellent question. That is not something I have examined. And part of the reason is methodologically, up until this week, I have not been able to test people in the two situations in order to compare them. Um, the other um, practical change that the pandemic has made is the introduction of masking and uh, testing settings. And it's well known from um, a, a literature on speech and hearing, um, particularly in older adults, that um, uh, when the face is covered, that um, comprehension is worse because the uh, visual cues that the mouth provides are very, very important to hearing in persons with um, uh, hearing issues. So um, there's a number of issues related to the pandemic that are, impact this kind of work. Um, and the one with masking, we do hope to um, explore. Thank you. There's one more question for you. Have you conducted or know of conversation memory studies with populations from different cultures, such as people who may use more gestures when they talk versus who don't, and how this may influence memory for conversation or recall accuracy? <laughs> That's a great question. We So we're starting to do this work now. And in particular, we're doing it in individuals with, who have a traumatic brain injury. So gesture is um, uh, beneficial both to the person doing the gesturing as well as the person who is uh, listening. Um, it tends to benefit learning and memory. And so one of the things that we're going to be looking at um, when we roll this out um, with persons with traumatic brain injury is some of the communicative interventions that we can do to improve memory for what's said, particularly as you imagine reflecting on a doctor-patient conversation and improving memory for those conversations and gesture might be one component that we could leverage to improve memory for those types of conversations and in individuals who have sustained an injury. Hey, thank you once again. That was great. All the presentations have been so interesting. And we are now excited to hear about the work that Dr. Lambert is conducting. Joe. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, so I was given seven minutes to talk about my research and anyone who knows me knows that's not enough time <laughs> to be, not because my research, my content is complex, but just because I am verbose. I, I like to really get into the details. So instead of talking about any specific project, I want to talk to you about um, my experience learning about the concept of steak or excellence as it relates to steak. Can you um, advance us? Um, oh, one, one, one back. Um, so the story that I want to tell you, and I, I promise you it does get to my research, it has to do with the first time that I contacted the concept of excellence, which was the first time also that I tasted steak. Um, I was with my dad. I remember it vividly. Uh, we were low SES, and so we couldn't afford steak very often. He was very excited about it um, when he got the steak, and he took a lot of time to prepare it, and it was really good steak. And so I was he, he, when we were at the dinner table, he cut his piece first and he ate it. And he said, Oh my God, that is excellent. And I look at him, I'm like, excellent. What's this word? I don't know what this word is. Um, so I cut my piece of steak and I take a bite out of it. 
And it's the first time I experienced both steak and excellence. And so I'm like, wow, yeah, excellent. This is fantastic. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I, for my dad, he was, he was talking about really good steak. And for me, I, would, I thought that steak and, and excellence were kind of the same thing. And so the next time we had steak, um, it was burnt. And I cut it up and I, mean, I had already learned how to react to this scenario. So I put the burnt steak in my mouth and I said, wow, mm, dad, this is excellent. He's like, no, son, this is not excellent steak. This is horrible steak. Um, and I was like, well, but okay. And so through this process of trial and error and, error and experience-based learning, I start to learn that the, 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 the verbal community, my immediate verbal community doesn't allow me to label all instances of steak as excellent. There's a certain quality of steak that I, like when I experience it, I can say excellent, but if it's too hard or if it's burnt or if it's underprepared, I can't call it excellent or otherwise that gets punished. So I'm like, okay, got it. Steak or excellence is a certain quality of steak. Um, and, I, and so I move forward. As backdrop, I'm from Chicago and I grew up in the nineties with Michael Jordan. Um, was playing a lot of basketball for the Chicago Bulls. And, and now the story has been told, but we were experiencing that story as it was being, as it was unfolding. And every single year was really exciting for us. And I remember the first time that the Bulls played the LA Lakers. Um, I was in a Puerto at a bar at the Puerto Rican Society in Waukegan, Illinois. And there's this basketball player on the Lakers named Vlad Divac, and he was lighting us up. And we were not sure we were going to win the series, and we were nervous. And I remember that there was a specific mood. I'm not exactly sure which Bulls player it was, but I attribute it to Jordan. He goes up for a shot, and he draws a foul from Vlad Divac. And so Vlad Divac fouls out of the game at that point, and also the, the ball goes in. So Jordan scores some points, and Divac's out, and the entire bar goes, ah! they're so excited and my dad screams that's excellent and I was excited and I stopped and looked at my dad and I was like wait a second excellence is steak what's going on here and so through this process of trial and error again I start to learn that you can still label instances of basketballs also being excellent or not but there are also rules around this like if you don't shoot the ball enough or if you shoot too much if you're not passing you're not playing defense you can't call it excellent but there's a certain quality of play um, that's labeled excellent and so I was like, oh shit, this is weird. And on the way home from that game, just incidentally, I'm driving home with my mom. And this is back before Spotify. You can't listen to good music on demand. And um, she turns on the radio and Antonio Vivaldi comes on. We're listening to and the four seasons. And my mom's like, oh, this is excellent. And I was like, ding, got it. Excellence, at least to me. I don't know what it is to you. But it, it's, it's something I get to say when I experience a private event. Um, and so regardless of the experience that produces, it can be across audio, visual, factor. It doesn't matter what the stimulus experience is, but there's a certain private event that when I experience it, I get to say excellence. And, be, and because this, there's a certain quality that kind of evokes or elicits it, often the verbal community is experiencing it at the same time as me, and they get to reinforce whether or not I say excellence. Well, this is fantastic. I am so interested. What, what does it take to produce excellence? Go ahead and fast forward us or get us forward one slide. And through direct experience, um, I've learned. And so this, like, this small notation that the solid arrows are, are learning that is a product of direct experience and hashed arrows are derived learning, learning that isn't a product of, of, of direct experience. So across time, I've learned that excellence is often a direct product of repertoire motivation or contingency, and contingency. What that means is that outcomes are valued by certain people, and that's motivation. <laughs> and because those outcomes are valued, by, they develop repertoires, they develop a skill set, so they can produce consistently that outcome, um, and they have reasons to produce that outcome. So Jordan, Vivaldi, my dad. They developed a skill set that was able to produce a very specific stimulus quality, a very specific experience that allowed us to label what they did as excellent. Okay, so now we can move forward. <laughs> so I work with the tail end of the tail end of a population, uh, children with disabilities and severe challenging behavior. And I, I, all of my data is N of one, single case design, and we collect time series data and there's a few conventions that are important to my lab. One is that aggression is always represented by closed circles. And the other is that if, uh, effective and independent communication or self-advocacy is represented by open squares. 
Um, and what we've learned across time is that there's often an inverse relation be between aggressive acts and effective self-advocacy. That is the extent to which you are able to communicate your needs and get your needs met is the extent to which you're not being aggressive. And the inverse is true. And so I'll never forget the first time that I experienced these data in my life. I was consulting for a child with severe aggression. And this is somebody who was like putting, like, well, the entire family was in a state of crisis because aggression is really hard on everyone involved. And so I go in and I'm kind of the bad guy. Like a child's mad at me um, because I'm, you know, doing therapy and the parent's mad at me because I'm not, you know, I'm doing something different. So I got the child and the, and the mom both mad at me. There's lots of aggression, um, crying. Um, and, and, and I want to insist that the child just use her words to ask for the, to get her needs met and, and not use aggression anymore. And it's just this really harrowing experience that lasts for five, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. And I'm starting to feel the pressure, the social, like, it's just a matter of time before I get kicked out of this house. And I'm really, really worried about it. The child's screaming and, and everyone's screaming. And all of a sudden, right when I'm about to, I'm sure I'm going to get kicked out of the house. The child says, can I have a break? Yeah. And because I'm a scientist, I want to replicate it. I say, so we started again, we present another demand. And she said, no, 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 I, I would like a break, please. And um, there was silence. And the first time I experienced that, I said, wow, that is excellent. And I wanted to give my life to that. So what does it take for me to be able to do this for the rest of my life? Can you advance this slide? <clears throat> and because I had already learned this, I knew um, that it, I needed to find a reason <laughs> to develop a repertoire to produce this valued outcome. So I got a job as a PhD, I got my PhD and I started studying methods for producing this outcome and everyone I came into contact with. And then I learned this really hard truth that to do this well, this is really hard work. And all of my research is surrounded about, is surrounded around like accomplishing this in the most durable way possible. And it's really hard. In best case scenario, this costs six months of my life for every single case that I do. And then I start to do the math. And what does it take for me to make it like, like how much impact am I going to have in my own personal life? It's like, wow, I'm going to affect a few kids a year max. <laughs> And damn, I, I would like to do more than that. And so I realize I come to this conclusion that um, I need help. And so it's like, who else um, is capable of doing this, values this outcome, and has a reason to do this? And so we advance. And after coming here, I've learned time and again that Peabody students are consistently motivated by these outcomes and consistently capable of producing these outcomes. And so the direct experience, I know, that these students have, they value outcome, they have the skill set, and they have reasons to do it. And without anyone ever training me to associate <laughs> the names of the specific students who have worked with me and the word excellence, go ahead and advance it one more time. Um, I often derive um, the concept of excellence with Peabody students. Now, consequently, um, this triangle with these hashed lines are, are actually an operational definition of a symbol, um, and in my lab, um, the psychological functions of symbols on lived experience is very, very important. Um, the ways that symbols guide us to interpret <laughs> what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis feels to me like the key to um, accomplishing thorough <laughs> and, 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 and and durable on a therapy for severe challenging behavior. So it's something that we, we're challenging ourselves to um, really unlock in our lab. And as a result, we've adopted, go ahead and advance one more time, um, the symbol of a symbol as a symbol of our lab. And um, the, 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 this symbol is just slightly different than the other symbol. It's thematically related, but you'll notice that there are absent reference here and that the whole thing is, uh, not everything's quite as spelled out and that's by design because only people who graduate from my lab uh, get to know what the actual symbol means. Um, and so that's where I'll leave it because uh, I think I'm over time. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lambert. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Min because I know some questions have come in for you. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lambert. Um, your first question is, at the Lambert Lab, what types of clinical opportunities do graduate students have to apply what they learn in their classrooms? Uh, we design at least the classrooms that I teach to be pr pretty direct complements of what they're experiencing in the field. I feel like the, the academic work is useful and to the extent to which it can be um, applied to solving real world problems. And so there's, there, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for you to apply what you're learning in the classroom. In Lambert Lab and pretty much any field experience in special education, we're, we're pretty intentional about that. Thank you. And related to that, could you share some ongoing and maybe upcoming projects in your lab? Yeah, we're really, really invested in figuring out what makes uh, kids escalate. Um, escalations are uh, kind of the bane of our existence. They're embarrassing, they're hard to watch, they're hard to experience, and they, and they often um, preclude effective therapy because people don't want to deal with them. They don't happen all the time, and we don't understand why they happen. And so we're, we're we're kind of attacking that problem from as many different angles as we possibly can. And, and so that is the focus of our, um, treat, our, of our research lab right now. Thank you so much once again. And we are going to turn it over to our last presenter for this evening. Um, so Dr. Luis Leva, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Luis Leva. Thank you so much for having me. Dean Mancilla Martinez and the Peabody uh, Dean's Office for organizing this event. Um, I am going to share with you a little bit about our research lab called PRISM, which stands for Power, Resistance, and Identity in STEM Education. Before I begin my talk, I want to acknowledge that I'm presenting on Vanderbilt campus, which are the lands of the displaced, uh, the displaced lands of the Shawnee, the Cherokee, and the UT tribes. Um, my research lab, our research lab, really is centered on um, the experiences of students who are historically marginalized at different intersections of systems of power and oppression, including anti-Black racism, white supremacy, and cis-heteropatriarchy. In doing this work, it's important for me to acknowledge my own positionality because in certain ways I benefit from forms of privilege as well as experience forms of oppression in relation to those systems. I identify um, as being a cisgender male. And so I have that privilege coming into this space. I also identify as Latin, I'm um, Cuban American, and to a certain, and depending on context and phenotypically and linguistically, I can pass as white in different spaces. And by co being cognizant of that positioning, I also am cognizant of being queer identifying, um, being the son of two Cuban immigrant parents who raised myself and my brother on the incomes of um, custodial wages and maintenance labor wages. And with those intersections is my viewpoint on the world. And that's my viewpoint. And the work that I do has to be in solidarity and community with others because I can only view things and interpret things from my own lens, which is how the lab comes into play. And this is a space uh, to be able to build a sense of solidarity and community to advance social justice in STEM higher education. Uh, next slide, please. It's really important in my work that with the participants in my research studies that they see themselves reflected in the researchers who are engaging with them through our work. And so it's really important for me to ensure that there is diversity in terms of identities, but also in lived experiences to be able to grow um, intellectually and also socially together. Our lab was established in the year 2018. Our work is really committed to issues of social justice, looking at teaching and learning, as well as student support practices in undergraduate STEM. And we try to characterize through the narratives of students' lived experiences, the ways in which white cis heteropatriarchy signaling back to that systemic oppression that I was mentioning earlier, how is that functioning as well as how is that disrupted through students' narratives of their oppression and agency um, in pursuing STEM majors. And so our the PRISM Lab is a space for us to be able to theorize intersectionally. It's also a space that for us to critically interrogate our positioning in relation to this work through critical reflexivity, but it's also a space for transformative solidarity to advance justice in STEM. Next slide. 
So we're going to, I'm going to be, I have the fortunate opportunity this upcoming year at the annual meeting of the American Educational Research Association to be part of a session about humanizing research labs and educational research with a couple of colleagues from Stanford, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Northwestern University, um, where we're going to be sharing our different practices that uh, interrogate broad systems of oppression and how we shape our practices within our labs. And so I asked research lab members in PRISM to, to share about their experiences in our lab and how is it a humanizing experience. And for the purposes of today, I've solicited some themes here as a good qualitative researcher to be able to illustrate to you ways in which these practices have been formative for lab members' personal and also professional development. The first thing that I have here from these quotes are the ways in which we co-construct knowledge together. So in our lab, we are constantly creating interview protocols. Interviews are the centerpiece for a lot of our, our study designs. And we're constantly centering participants' safety and well-being and wholeness in relation to this work. And so here we have some lab members sharing about some of those practices. Uh, next portion of the slide. Another piece is PRISM is an opportunity to be able to apprentice lab members into engaging in research. And so many students oftentimes talk about, I never thought of myself as becoming a researcher, but in this lab, I've begun to kind of realize what it is entailed to actually engage in the research process. And, but also I'm learning from students in this lab as well. And so one of our lab members is really well-versed in trauma-informed practices. And so I began to ask and other lab members asked about what, that's, what that is and how that could be incorporated in our work with, um, with historically marginalized students. Next portion. In addition to that, PRISM is a space of becoming. So students are being able to kind of see their lived experiences reflected in the community that we have in our lab. And this is a lab in which it's not necessarily just about my research. Um, so I kind of create the opportunities and students are, have opportunities to build intellectual leadership through the data and through the different lines of analysis. And so I actually am a proud lab director when students are able to say, I really wanna lead this analysis and pursue it further um, on my own. Next portion. And because of the COVID pandemic, we are centered on flexibility and person first approaches. So the way that we center participants in our work, I as a lab director am, um, am very committed to making sure that there's flexibility and a sense of support for our lab members to be able to do good work. You can't show up to this work if you're not whole. Next slide. So our lab is intergenerational and interdisciplinary. So here I'm highlighting um, my two doctoral student advisees who are members of our lab, Taylor and Nicolette. Next portion. We also have master students who form part of our lab where um, you can see that many uh, of our lab members are not just teaching and learning um, affiliates. We also have members from HOD. Lorelli is a member of the School of Medicine pursuing a master's in public health. Next portion. Undergraduate students. So Enrique is pursuing a bachelor's at in cognitive science and second human development. And these are our current members. The next portion are our alumni. And so I put that in gold because we've got black and gold and it's Vanderbilt. Uh, and so here you see uh, various different um, alumni members who, have, who are going on to do incredible things. So Xander, for example, was an HOD alum who I met through the Vanderbilt Undergraduate Summer Research Program. Uh, Liz King is now pursuing a PhD in family science and human development. B. Bomber is currently doing some work on veteran health and police abolition movements. And so these are folks who, um, who are coming into the work to be able to contribute to our, our mission. Next slide. Uh, some projects, so uh, two National Science Foundation funded uh, projects that we're working on right now are focused on equity mindedness and practices in undergraduate calculus instruction and other introductory math courses. Um, so we have the TIPS project and the COURAGE project that we're currently working on. Next portion. Uh, I'm currently finishing up my tenure as a postdoctoral fellow with the National Academy of Education and the Spencer Foundation, exploring the experiences of LGBTQ students of color in STEM uh, multi-institutionally, including historically white and, and minority serving institutions across the country. Next slide. Uh, we've also been doing some theoretical work in our lab to interrogate issues of intersectionality around gender racism for women of color in computing and engineering fields. Next slide. And um, 
recently I was fortunate to be invited to be a fellow with the Mindset Scholars Network that's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to examine and theorize equity mindedness, uh, specifically in undergraduate mathematics education and, and, and work on a literature review uh, through that work. Next, next slide. Um, and some products from our prism. So uh, we have the traditional forms of uh, products that we have. You'll notice here that I am very committed to co-authoring with uh, my student advisees. All of the students who are listed on here um, under our master students and, and doctoral students, Brittany Marshall is one of our external lab members uh, pursuing a PhD at Rutgers in math education. So this is our piece in the Journal of Higher Education. Next portion. We also get to um, go around uh, to different conferences and share our work. And so you'll see here that Xander Alley, who was an undergrad, had an opportunity to co-present with me at the Association for Higher Education in 2018. Alexandria Cervantes was a McNair Scholars over at California uh, State uh, University at Monterey Bay, who came over to Vanderbilt for an entire summer to work with me. Um, and we did some work together on uh, Latin students' experiences and introductory math courses. And then we got to present that at the joint math meetings, which is the largest gathering of mathematicians in one spot. Uh, next portion. And here's Brittany Marshall, who I mentioned over at Rutgers. Um, this is an, actually an example of, of, of an opportunity for students to actually create their own leadership, intellectual leadership on a project. Uh, Brittany was really interested in and specifically in black women's perceptions of calculus instructional practices in my calculus work and got to present that at the research and undergraduate math education conference last piece. And we've had uh, an opportunity to be able to be invited into a learning community that was hosted by the Center for Teaching on Promoting Persistence in STEM that was organized by um, by the Center for Teaching and CFT and uh, Taylor Brittany and I got to be able to share some perspectives from our research during that gathering. Last slide. And if you are interested in joining PRISM, um, feel free to contact me. And it was it's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Leva. Um, I know that there are already questions for you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Min so she can share those out with you. Thank you. Uh, the first question is, how do you go about communicating your findings to the public and educational stakeholders, especially those who may be unfamiliar with or less receptive to intersectional justice in education? That's a great question. So one of the main stakeholders that our research speaks to is STEM academic departments in higher education. And so since we've been doing this work uh, around calculus and introductory mathematics and this large uptick around higher education around anti-racist practices pedagogically we've been um we've been engaging a lot with speaking to department chairs and speaking to faculty around some of our findings i think one of the important things to be able to relay this information to stakeholders is to meet them where they are and so oftentimes the practices that are equity minded we have to interrogate that sometimes practices that we think are good teaching practices in mathematics are oftentimes the, the, and tied to the ways that we've conceived the discipline. And that although we might say it's a well-intended act to be able to do or say something. So for example, in calculus, you might hear an instructor say, if you can't do this fast enough, you should consider dropping down a level. While a faculty member may think of that as being supportive for a student, in certain ways, when you think about broader structural inequalities that inhibits students from being able to continue and persist with mathematics, right? And so while it's a well-intended act of pedagogically, we help faculty members to think through what could be the impact, right? This intent versus impact and really centering students' experiences of those instructional practices. Um, so I would say that a main stakeholder audience would be STEM academic departments through our work. Thank you. There's one more question for you. How has the COVID pandemic affected how you frame your work on intersectional theorizing and social justice as students return to somewhat of a normalcy in the classrooms? Yeah, so one of the things that we intentionally did, so when, I, when we pitched the project to be able to do the LGBTQ students of color, it was before COVID started in 2020. And so our team had to significantly shift the study design to think about the complexities for LGBTQ students of color and the vulnerabilities of their participation on our work. So one of the things that we ended up including in our recruitment form is asking students, 
what is needed for you to feel comfortable being able to participate in this space while knowing that many times college campuses are spaces where many students might find opportunities to kind of find social affirmation for their identities. And they might feel vulnerable talking about these experiences from home or in other public settings. And so one of the things that we were really mindful of with the COVID shift is how are we centering our students' wellness and how are we centering our students' comfort in being able to do this work from an ethical and moral responsibility as researchers? Sorry, I was getting to the screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Leva. And I want to um, take the time. We're exactly at five o'clock. I'm very proud of the fact that we're ending right on time. Um, this is such excellent conversation and here on the screen you will see the names and email addresses of our five excellent presenters for today in case you didn't get a chance to engage and want to follow up i'm sure they will be very receptive to um, communicating with you so once again i hope you got a little taste of the research that is ongoing in um, our research labs across our five departments we thank you for joining hope everyone stays safe and has a great thanksgiving and until next time, stay tuned for information on our next Peabody Research Spotlight, which will be at some point um, in January, 2022. Thanks everyone.